Hello, and welcome to Fine Arts Friday. I'm Sarah Newbold, and I'm the Fine Arts Content Specialist for Montgomery County Public Schools. The MCPS art teachers have a Friday tradition where we come together to discuss ideas, lessons, and cool things about art. And today, we thought we would invite the whole community to join us virtually via Zoom. Today's show is titled, Talking Art with Phil Hansen. Phil Hansen, who is a world-famous multimedia artist, will be joining us via video throughout the program. You're going to love this guy. Joining me now in our Zoom studio for this discussion, I'm pleased to welcome Anjali Wells, an art teacher at John F. Kennedy High School, Jacob Hicks, an art teacher at Earl B. Wood Middle School, and Ron Kohler, an art teacher at Meadow Hall Elementary School. Hi, everyone. Hey. 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 I'm so glad you're here with me on this Zoom session. This spring, we started a continuity of learning plan due to COVID-19 and the school buildings being closed. As an art team, we had to quickly create a new model for art instruction. It was a real challenge because we didn't know what materials students would have available at home. Then we got inspired by the artist Phil Hansen, who is famous for his TED Talk called Embrace the Shake. And that talk became the inspiration for our entire continuity of learning plan for the visual arts. Phil uses a wide variety of materials and techniques for creating his art. Let's get a little flavor of Phil, his art, his creativity, as we watch this short video called Surprise from Phil in the Circle. our teachers what do you think this video clip tells you about Phil and the artistic process that limitations don't necessarily mean a shortage of art making options um, it just tells me that the creative process can be applied to absolutely anything and everything regardless of what you have used traditionally Sarah I'm just wondering how he's gonna get home without any shoes <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> so based on Phil's philosophy or his approach to art, how has our new continu continuity of learning plan affected your teaching? Well, we were all thrown these lemons and I decided to embrace the potential of remote learning and, you know, make lemonade. We had to develop engaging, open-ended art experiences using only the materials that students had available. 
No, Hanson really showed me and taught me how to really change my approach to how I was thinking, which is what he does with each material he uses. So traditionally, I would start by thinking about the materials that I wanted students to use or ones they haven't used. And being at home, I couldn't control any of that. So I changed my approach and started thinking about guiding students through creative problem solving and how I can get them to engage in different parts of the artistic process, depending on whatever they had at home. I think that during this time, as art teachers, we've all had to kind of rethink our strategies based on the limitations with materials and stuff that you would typically find in the classroom. But going virtual caused us to adapt and use the internet to find new ways to create art and new ways to share ideas. Well, thanks for sharing your thoughts. Phil Hansen's art was a big hit with our students, and they had lots of questions. So we reached out to Phil, and he was delighted to oblige. Some of our students sent in video questions, and Phil answered them with some very clever responses, which were like art itself. So let's take a look. Hi, my name is Chase, and I'm in kindergarten at Flower Valley Elementary. And my question is, how old were you when you started making art? How old was I when I first started making art? You know, I, I, I drew a little bit in elementary school and a little bit more in middle school, but it was in high school when I was able to take my first art class. I was a sophomore, and that's really where I kind of got introduced to arts, but it was really, I think, because I had a friend who was drawing as well, and so he and I would just hang out and draw a lot, and that's, I think, really where a lot of my early art came from, was just hanging out with my friend and in high school drawing pictures. Hi, my name is Anka Marjbine. I am a first grader in Jones Lane Elementary School. My question is, how and where do you get your ideas from? My ideas really come from all over the place. It might be one of the many, many ideas that I have written down and I have spreadsheets of ideas. I have just concepts and materials and all kinds of lists. I like to keep lists because I tend to think of an idea in the moment and then it goes away and I forget about it. And so it's good to have it written down. But then also things that sometimes literally pass me by, I will look at and I'll say, there's maybe an art, a way to make an artwork with that. And then I begin to explore it and try to figure out what makes me interested in it. And then there's a picture. Hi, my name is Mateo Gutierrez Ovaya. I am in first grade at Rachel Carson Elementary School. Phil Hansen, do you like to dance? I do enjoy dancing, but it's usually pretty comical. But then one time I was like, maybe I could use my horrible dance moves and find a way to make an artwork within dance. And so what I did is I actually hooked up what you can't see in this video right now is I have a big bag on my back, kind of like a backpack, and there's paint in it. And then there's tubes running down the backs of my pants to the shoes. And so I'm able to paint a picture as I do some horrible dance moves. Hi, my name is Bear Kless. I'm in second grade at Chris McAuliffe Elementary School. My question for Phil Hansen is how many pairs of shoes do you have? I think I have a normal amount of shoes, between hiking shoes, regular shoes, flip-flops, maybe five or six pairs, but I'm guessing you're asking about this shoe, which is one that I actually use in different ways to paint pictures with. Portraits of myself, and I don't know, I have a lot of these shoes. I found them one time, they were, they were on sale. And I think I probably have five pairs of the same shoe, uh, which is really useful on one end, but also makes me look like I wear the same shoe all the time sometimes. Hi, my name is Sasha Becker. I go in second grade at Seven Locks Elementary School. My question for Phil Hanson is what do you choose first, materials or theme? Which comes first, the material or the theme? Well, for me, it really depends on, of course, all kinds of parameters. Sometimes something just kind of jumps out and grabs me, and other times I have to kind of work my way to the material. So the idea comes first, the theme, the portrait, you know, whatever I want to make, and then I figure out how to create it. Or sometimes I see a material and I'm like, I want to make a picture with that. Like steel wool. Steel wool is something that, oddly enough, I actually want to make a picture with. And I ordered a bunch of steel wool and I have it sitting in the studio because what happens 
of steel walls, you can actually light it on fire and it burns. And so I think it'd be really kind of beautiful to make a big picture of a steel wall and then light it on fire and watch it kind of burn across. So anyway, there's something to explore over the summer is very safely if you do to burn steel wool. <laughs> Those were some amazing questions and answers. And while Phil dabbles in all kinds of ways to make art, students, please do not even think about using fire when making your own art. Safety first. And if you are unsure about doing any unique art creations, please talk with your parents or an adult first. Now, before we continue with more videos from video questions from Phil, let's watch a little montage of artwork the students and teachers recently made both with traditional and untraditional art supplies. What did you think of the artwork our students have been creating? There was a surprising level of sophistication in the student artworks that were submitted. I was really impressed by the variety of the work and how it captures the diversity in our community. I think it's incredible that our students were able to discover so many new ways to use materials, ways that they probably didn't even know before now. Yeah, not being in the art room did not stop these students. There's some really great stuff. And to see more student artwork, please visit the MCPS Fine Arts Virtual Gallery. It's online, and I'm gonna tell you the website, but it's really long, so here it goes. It's sites.google.com slash mcpsmd.net slash mcpsvirtualarts slash home. Now let's listen to a few more student questions and Phil's responses. Hi, my name is Calvin Miyaki Cha, and I am in third grade at Ritchie Park Elementary School. Mr. Hansen, what is the weirdest art material you have used, and how long does it usually take to plan your art? Thank you. The weirdest material, I, I, I don't know, because it depends on what's weird, but you can tell I'm holding a record in my hand, because using a record, usually you'd find a way to keep it pristine and beautiful, but breaking records apart? Ah. 
there, now that was a good explosion. So breaking the records apart and using records, that is something that's a little unusual for sure. Uh, and I actually still have pieces of records in the ceiling of the studio around the corner over there. In terms of how long it takes to plan a project, you know, I've, I vary pretty widely. Uh, there's definitely things that I have actually been thinking about for years, but I don't necessarily really plan them in terms of years, but actually sitting down and trying to plan artwork maybe takes anywhere from one hour to eight hours. I'd say eight hours is probably a bit of a stretch for me, but definitely, definitely a couple to a few hours for planning a picture is, is not unusual at all. Hi, I'm Eleanor and I'm in third grade at Rock Creek Forest. My question is, what, which art are you most proud of? An artwork that I'm most proud of, I, I, that's a bit of a hard answer for me because what I tend to be most proud of is the one I'm most excited about, which tends to be the one that I'm working on right now. Uh, but actually last year I did a gallery show in Omaha, Nebraska, and the three artworks that I brought down there I thought were were, were pretty darn cool on my end, which is, is fun to think of your own art as, as kind of entertaining and cool. But I made a, a there's a skull chair, a picture made with $10,000 in cash, and then another chair that blows up and inflates around you and wraps you in a little cocoon of shiny silver, which was pretty darn fun to make. Hi, my name is Natalie Hale. I'm in fourth grade at Laytonsville Elementary School. My question is, when you can't think of any ideas for your artwork, how do you overcome this and what do you create? Bye. You know, one thing I mentioned was lists, and I do keep a lot of lists and just kind of ideas floating around me constantly in, in the space that I'm in. There's always something that there is potential to be worked with or an idea written down somewhere. So I do that. In terms of how do I know which one to create, that's always a struggle. Uh, I tend to work on many projects at once and so I have projects that are very much in the background and I work on them a little bit, little bit, little bit and bring them closer and closer to a point of actually being truly worked on and being finished. So I do kind of have a little bit of a funnel or a conveyor belt of ideas that are coming towards me. But beyond that, I really oftentimes just force myself, like I'm going to create with this today, or I have a material that has been in the background for a long time. And I'm like, you know what, that one looks, that one looks fun. I'm gonna work with that. Hi, I'm Maddie Peters. I go to Greenwood Elementary School. I'm 11 years old and in fifth grade. My question for Phil Hansen is, what strategies can I use to get better at creating art? I'm not that good of an artist and my brother is. I think the most important strategy to getting better is to not compare yourself to other people because all of a sudden you're better. <laughs> and I, I know that that sounds a little jokey and it is, but at the same time, it is really the most important factor because you can have an absolutely amazing artist who then, you know, they just maybe stop making art. And so to compare yourself to somebody who has a high skill set in the art world is a really just, I, I, I think, not the way to go. So it's really important to work on your own skill set, your own motivation because there's a lot more that goes into making a career with art that goes beyond the skill set. You know, you got to have that business sense. You got to have to find a way to make a living from it. And being able to take all of those skill sets and mash them together, having a really, really high quality art skill set is actually not the most important thing by, by any means. So keep yourself open to the entire process, but really just don't, don't compare yourself to people because when you're learning something new, it's good to look up to people, but not as a comparison factor of who's better and who's worse. Hi, Mr. Hansen. My name is Sahara Nurthi. I am in fifth grade and I go to Brown Station Elementary School. My question to you is, how did it make you feel when you destroyed your first art and goodbye art? You know, destroying my first goodbye art picture was, was definitely one of the tougher things I've done just because it felt unpurposeful, it felt weird and wrong and I'd never done it before, but after destroying one, then destroying another, and then 23 artworks in total, it felt very meaningful and it definitely had an impact on my life. But the, the first one was definitely not fun. It didn't feel important to do. It felt like nobody cared except for me and that was ultimately the, the, the point of it. That was the important part was that I cared about that process and I wanted to see what happened to my own art, to myself, if I destroyed stuff for a year. Let's talk a little bit about Phil's Goodbye Art Series. He actually makes art to get destroyed. What are your thoughts about that? 
Well, the destruction as much as a part of the process as its creation. It takes a lot of nerve to destroy your own art. Yeah, I agree. I think it's really cool how the destruction becomes like part of the performance almost. Yeah, the idea of destroying art, it's refreshing. It's kind of the moment where you come to terms with the idea that your artwork is finished and now it's time to move on to something new. Thank you. Phil is extremely creative and totally thinks outside the box. Actually, he seems to make his own box. Now let's hear some more questions and answers. Hello, my name is Rachel Dubik and I go to Redland Middle School. And my question is, what has been challenging about making art at home for you? I would say without question, the hardest part of making art at home these days is motivation. And what I did for motivation not that long ago is I actually had a huge picture up on the wall here. If this isn't huge enough for you, there was one that was actually much bigger. And I literally set myself uh, a timer and I had to work six hours a day on it. And I actually ended up working live so then other people could kind of check in on, on the work that I was doing. And I did that for maybe eight, nine days to get this picture done. And so really just having a schedule put a completely different mindset on, on, on that motivation. But for me, that was, that was the hardest part of, of creating at home. And, and well, I, I kind of figured out a little bit of a, a tip and a trick just for myself even. My name is Nathan Hill. I'm in seventh grade and I go to Gethersburg Middle School. My question is, when you make artwork, what is more important to you? To make you happy or others happy? And how do you do, and how do you feel successful when someone does not approve of your artwork or does not like it? Bye. Definitely making myself happy over other people with my art. Uh, Keeping the focus on ourselves doesn't, it, it might feel a little selfish in a certain sense, but actually being able to maintain that, the motivation to continue creating, just keeping yourself entertained is the most important thing in the world. I feel like a lot of people put pressure on artists to make art for other people. And I personally don't, I don't like that. I don't subscribe to that. I think it's really important that, you know, if it's a hobby that we have for ourselves, it's a passion we have for ourselves, well, whatever we choose to do with it is what we choose to do with it. And so having, having that happy that that motivation you maintain that for yourself I think is really really important you know, I feel there's so many different points of success with art you know there's the point of success with coming up with a good idea for a sculpture a comic book or painting or whatever you're creating so coming up with a great idea that is that's a that's awesome that's that is a success in and of itself and then getting through all the trials and tribulations of actually being able to create the artwork that you desire in your head that is a success and then once it's finished, putting it out into the world, I feel is a whole different thing. You know, that like, there's like a line that we cross where it's almost, it's not ours anymore. Like we need to at least detach ourselves from the feedback that we see, that we hear from people because that is somebody else's perspective and we need to treat it as such. And so when I finish an artwork, if I share it with everyone, I kind of, kind of, cut it off in a certain sense. And whatever people say is what they say, but I'm gonna try my hardest not to let that impact me. Hi, my name is Katie Celia Amador and I'm in ninth grade at Paint Branch High School. My question for Phil Hansen is how did you wake your passion for art using things no one would have thought of and how did you create masterpieces of them? I think I've always been pretty explorative with materials and finding my way into using small materials to make bigger pictures actually came from uh, my interest in pointillism, you know, just using dots to make a picture. And that kind of fragmentation really opened me up to this idea that, you know, if you just replace the dot with a different material, you can make any picture you want. And so that's also kind of, I think I found my way into, you know, could I create a picture with these weird materials is I kind of had two ideas is one, if you can break it apart and make it into a fragment, you can make a picture with a fragment. You just think of it as like a, a brush stroke or, you know, a pencil stroke. And two, if I can find a couple shades within a material, I can make a picture. You know, all you need is two shades, white and black or some other version of two shades and you can make a picture. So that's all that I really need. And that's just kind of, that, that's a jumping off point for the exploration process. Hi, I'm Theodore Brader. I'm in 10th grade at Winston Churchill High. So, Mr. Phil Hansen, what inspired you to become an artist? You know, I'll, I'll be honest, um, this is kind of a tough question for me because I always kind of struggled with the idea of being an artist and the idea of making a living from art because that was something that 
one, I thought was basically impossible to do, and I didn't really want to put that pressure on myself of making a living from the things that I've made. Because once you start to make a living from something, then it starts to change what you create, because you have to sell it. You have to make money from it to make a living, and all of a sudden, it's, it becomes a different thing. It's maybe not so much about passion, it's about need at that point. And so being an artist was something that kind of happened naturally in my life. It wasn't something that I really directly sought out. I always loved to create, and I just thought of myself as a creator for a long time. I didn't even put the label of art on my art for a long time. So that was something that kind of happened as the years went by. I was like, you know, I'm making a living from this. I think, I think I'm an artist at this point. And the stuff that I have, there's, you know, there's a reason and meaning that I create things that I do. And that's where I finally found myself. So it was something that just happened naturally. Hello, my name is Kara Saruka. I'm a ninth grader in Jenna Kennedy High School. And my question is, what tips do you have for being successful in the world of art? I would say I don't have any tips on how to make a living in the art world because it's gonna be different for everybody. Um, and just, I guess, making a living from your creativity in general is gonna be different for everybody. But if you're looking at that world, you know, one, just stay open to where it might take you. You know, you might be aiming in a certain direction but be getting really pulled in another direction and be open to that process if you wanna make a living from it because where a living can come from can kind of reveal itself in different ways. But a more generalized tip is to understand that, you know, when you make something that might be really, really highly skilled, might be absolutely beautiful, well, who's gonna promote that? Who's going to share that with people? You know, it might be you going to galleries, sharing your work, putting together a portfolio, trying to get that gallery owner excited to not just put your work on the wall, but then to represent it and to share it with more people. Uh, but it might be you who needs to get out there and do that work. And so understanding and seeing that, you know, it's not just you make a great picture and then things happen. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of work that goes outside of that. There's been many, many times in my life where I think maybe I've spent half of my time actually working on, you know, connecting with people, finding ways to get my work seen, uh, doing all of the more the promotional aspect of it, which is kind of weird to talk about, but putting a ton of time in on that side as well as making work that you want to share, balancing those two out, that's probably the most likely place to find that, that, that combination where then you hit a moment where there's a, a success that you can build on and go from there. Hi Phil, my name is Carrie Bauer. I teach art at Jones Lane Elementary and Goshen Elementary. And my question for you is what is your favorite material to work with? Initially, I was thinking that I don't have a, a favorite art material because I have anything from a movie film, army soldiers, I mentioned steel wool, box of steel wool, jeans, more helicopter seeds, a bag of shredded money. Uh, so one, I do like to explore and find different materials that kind of push me in different ways. But at the end of the day, probably the material or method of creation, I don't know if it's a material, I mean, pen and ink, but uh, coming back to handwriting stories, that's something that I actually really love. And I keep enjoying that process of hearing stories from people and writing them down and making a picture. My name is Nash. I'm in fourth grade at Leeds Elementary School. My question is, who is your favorite artist and what do you like about their work? Now, I know you said one artist, but I'm gonna pick two. Uh, you can you can choose from those what you want, but I'm gonna go with Goya, uh, who is somebody that, uh, you know, I was always kind of intrigued and then, like his, his, his career was interesting, but I found a lot of his work to just be kind of very, very striking. Uh, it was very honest work, very beautiful stuff, often very, very hard to look at in the Disasters of War series, but I thought that's what was so powerful about it as well. And then the second one is Frank Frazetta. This is somebody who just, I always liked his work growing up. Um, I never really, I think made anything that was kind of in, you know, kind of in, inspired directly, but I just always liked the work that he created and, and always, always looked to it and got excited to then go and create my own. So our teachers, who is your favorite visual artist to teach about? Jacob Lawrence. He's a powerful storyteller and has brilliantly documented the black experience. I really love teaching about a couple of different portrait artists, um, including Jordan Castile, Amy Sherald, and Frida Kahlo. 
Um, there are so many amazing artists to choose from, but I think my students actually draw the greatest inspiration from each other. Um, they're the ones that are looking at the master artists and interpreting their work in all these new ways. So I find that when they're working together and talking about their art, really incredible things start to happen. Thank you for sharing that. Me, I personally really like Yoyoi Kasuma. While I love the way her infinity rooms transport you into another world, her paintings are really my favorite. I'm drawn to the way she uses vivid colors and exciting patterns. So, Mr. Kohler, can you tell us why should we make art? Well, making art addresses social and emotional needs and it allows us to connect with each other. It also gives us an outlet to work through our feelings. Well put, Mr. Kohler. What are some silver linings to how we have been teaching and exploring art during the COVID-19 and quarantine? Ms. Wells? I've been really impressed by the creativity that both our students and our teachers have been exhibiting um, within the limitations that we've had. And seeing the work that's come out of it has been really incredible. My biggest takeaway is the technology and how it's changing in my classroom. Um, there are just so many ways uh, of teaching and ways of communicating that I didn't realize were even possible until now. Everything I've learned in the past few months is going to change the way I teach forever. Remote art instruction liberates us from a fixed schedule. Students can devote as much time as they need to make their art. Very good point. So thanks for sharing all that. Uh, Mr. Mr. Kohler, do you have one last question for Phil Hansen? Yes, Phil, how did you prepare for your TED Talk? Preparing for a TED Talk was a pretty crazy process. There was, I don't know, maybe 80, 100 hours spent preparing for that one little moment, which is kind of weird. Um, I did everything from, well, of course, writing for weeks and weeks and weeks to when I was practicing my talk, I actually went on a roller coaster at the Mall of America and I gave my talk on a roller coaster because I figure if I can give it on a roller coaster, then I can probably present it in front of an audience. So doing kind of anything and everything to kind of prepare myself, I even made a fake little stage, but, you know, just taped it out on the floor. I put spotlights on myself so I could get used to the idea of being in front of people in the bright lights and having to hit cues and marks with my clicker and that kind of a thing. So there was a lot of effort that went into it to make something that just seems natural and comfortable, which that was the second speech I ever gave in my life. So it was definitely not natural and definitely not comfortable. So I too get very nervous during public speaking. Maybe I should try practicing on a roller coaster like Phil. If you'd like to learn more about Phil Hansen, check out his 10-minute TED Talk, Embrace the Shake, or you could visit his website, fillinthecircle.com, or he has a book called Tattoo a Banana. All right, everyone, any thoughts for this Fine Arts Friday? I really can't wait to see more. I'm really impressed by the creativity of our community, and I can't wait for the next Fine Arts Friday. Embrace your shake. Well, thank you all for, for participating in this talk today. And thank you to Phil Hansen for his energy, time, perseverance, and of course, his art. And to see recent student art, please visit the MCPS Fine Arts Virtual Gallery. We also have a site full of resources that will hopefully help to inspire you. So for all of you out there, be creative and make lots of art. Bye.